recevoir euh, Aiden Bendal, qui, bon, qui est un producteur, j'imagine que vous devez regarder un petit peu, si vous ne seriez pas là, voilà, logique. Donc je vais vous laisser en sa compagnie, et puis ben, je vous souhaite une agréable conférence. Merci. Hello. Hello, everybody. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to sit down. Actually, I'm a bit tired. Is that okay? You can hear me. Uh, well, thanks very much for coming. I'm. Um, I'm. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I'll start by saying I'm. I'm a bit surprised that we're all here because um, my favourite subject um, to talk about isn't me, actually. Uh, but. Um, I'm grateful to be here, and I'm grateful you're here. And hopefully we can talk about something that I do care about very much, which is um, recording and music and mixing. Um, but I would like it to be as useful for you as possible. So I would like as many questions as possible as well. And if any of you are shy to ask the questions in English, I do speak a little French, so please feel free to ask me in French and I'll try and understand. And if I can't understand, then I'm sure there's people here that could translate for us. But I, I do speak un peu de français, so we could, uh, we, we could try that. Anyway, so I think um, maybe uh, hello. <laughs> I think maybe we could start with me telling you a little bit about my history, not because I want to be arrogant about my history or, or, or not that I think it's particularly important, but at least you'll understand um, why, uh, you'll understand the sort of questions that you may think I'm capable of answering. So I'll tell you a little bit about my experience. Um, I, I, uh, when I, I was 16, 17, 18, well, even, no, even earlier, from, even earlier, I, I, um, I always loved music from, from being a child. My father was an artist and my mother was a dancer, so there was always a huge amount of music. Uh, my father was a visual artist, not a, not a musical artist. He's a painter and uh, carver and designer, um, and um, my mother was a dancer. So there was always music, there was always art going on at home, uh, and I just thought, you know, every child, I just thought everybody had that sort of background. Uh, but I loved music, and I still do, thankfully. But I. Um, from the age when I suppose one starts thinking about jobs and what to do, from about maybe 14, 15, 16, around that age, what I really wanted to do was be a doctor. Uh, and I really wanted to be a paediatrician. I, 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 I loved the idea of uh, being a doctor for children and, and, and young, young children, babies and, and young children. And um, when I grow up one day, maybe I can do that, because I, I still love the idea of that. But what, what happened, oh, hello, what happened was uh, suddenly, I was ready to go to university. I'd, I'd done all the studies and I was ready to go to university. Suddenly, I became uh, squeamish. Does, does everybody understand the word squeamish? Well, it means um, I, was, I was suddenly scared of blood or suddenly scared of uh, people in pain and scared of uh, tears. If I see somebody crying, I'll, I'll cry as well. My ears, my ears, my eyes will just be full of water. So it's not really good for a doctor to, to have that. And it was an overnight thing. So I thought, oh God, what should I do? So I, I didn't know what to do. <clears throat> now, during this period of my teens, I, I used to play in a group, uh, a piano and, and organ. And um, we had, the, the group was sort of not, not really successful, but we used to travel up and down England playing, uh, and the, the, uh, we had a manager, <coughs> a guy called Cliff Cooper. And Cliff was a man who started, he had a little second-hand guitar shop in, in um, Soho, in London, 
dum dum. Uh, and and um, he started. Have you heard of Orange Amplifiers? Some of you may have heard of Orange Amplifiers. Well, he started the company Orange, and his second-hand guitar shop was called Orange. So I was still going to go to university, and I was going to study, I can't remember, maybe sociology or something, because I had nothing else to do. In, in, in the 60s, if you didn't know what to study, you studied sociology. Because <laughs> um, obviously medicine, <laughs> I mean, I, I regret that, but medicine was something that I could no longer do. Um, so I said to Cliff, uh, Cliff, I need a job because I need, need some money before going to university. And he said, oh, that, that's fine. Come, come and work downstairs because we've, we've got a recording studio downstairs. So in the basement of the studio, of the basement of the guitar shop, there's a, a studio and it's a four track uh, you all have some technical knowledge, don't you? There's a, you understand if I say four track or sixteen? Okay. There was a four track tape recorder, Ampex four track tape recorder, and four track was the maximum amount of tracks we we had uh, at that time. So um, Cliff said, "Come and work in the studio downstairs." And uh, I walked into that studio, and it was like an epiphany. It's like I saw, I saw heaven. <laughs> Immediately, and I still feel I still feel the same way when I walk into the studio. To me, a studio is something fantastic, something holy, something sacred, something beautiful, something of endless fun and adventure. So uh, I was there, and um, I loved it. I loved it, and I worked with just as an assistant, not as an engineer, because when I was playing in the group, I loved everything about being in the group apart from playing. I mean, apart from performing, apart from being on stage. And I thought, suddenly thought, this is a studio where you could really explore all the creativity you have and other people have. And there wasn't the, the stress of people dancing and screaming and lights and stroboscopes and, and traveling and lifting heavy amplifiers and stuff. There wasn't all that, which I hated. And being on stage. So the, I hated being on stage and so, that's why it's surprising to find me here now in front of you all talking. <laughs> it's not something I've ever wanted to, I, I've had no ambition to do. Anyway, so I, 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 I was working in the studio and I, I met and worked with some incredible people. I mean, incredible people from that period of time. And um, I was, I worked with a, a band called Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac. You've heard of Fleetwood Mac. Uh, but then it's called Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac because the the, the lead guitarist uh, is a guy called Peter. Pete, funny enough, Peter Green, and um, they were a blues band. They weren't making pop records at all, but they, they were a blues band. And Peter was an incredible, incredible, and beautiful guitarist. Beautiful man, beautiful sound, beautiful guitarist. Um, and Peter actually, I made some really bad career choices in my life. Peter said to me, "Oh, do you want to join the band?" Fleetwood Mac. So, no, I don't like it. I don't, I don't like performing live. I don't really like blues. The idea of spending all my time spending three or playing three or four chords basically wasn't interesting to me. I, I mean, my attitude has changed to music now, but I was young and stupid, so allow me to be young and stupid at that age. So I, I said no to Peter, and that was fine. And, uh, but I worked with them a lot, and they, they were the first artists actually to buy orange amplifiers. And uh, I worked with Robin Gibb quite a lot, who, you know, from the Bee Gees, the guy Robin Gibb, who had the most beautiful, exquisite, tender, soft, gentle voice I've ever heard in my life. He's, what a, what a singer, what a lovely guy, um, beautiful. So I thought, I said, this is amazing, working with, working with these people. And then I worked with a band called The Pretty Things, who were very popular at the time. Um, there's a guitarist called Paul Kossoff I worked with a lot. Now, Paul Kossoff was a member of a band called Free. I don't know if you remember Free, or you know, you've heard of Free. Well, Paul Kossoff, uh, once again, was a fantastic musician, an incredible guitarist, and uh, he died of heroin addiction, sadly. But he was a wonderful man. But there was I, sort of 18, 19 years old, really excited to be in this environment. And... Um, 
I thought, well, I'm not going to university. Well, I could do this or I could do sociology. So I, I thought, I, I do, I'll do this instead. So I worked there for, I worked at Orange for a couple of years and it was great, but it was, um, had a bad effect on my health because I didn't sleep really for two years. And you imagine being in Soho. There was all sorts of things going on and I had limit, well, I thought I had limitless energy until my body sold me I didn't have limitless energy and it just sort of stopped. So I thought, well, if I work in, if I carry on working in studios, I'll die because I, I, was, I was really quite ill. And uh, I didn't have the self-control then because as I keep on saying, I was young and stupid. I'm old and stupid now, but I was, I was young and stupid then. So, hello, hello. Uh, um, so I thought I need a complete change of career. So I started working. I managed to get a job at the. Do you you know the manuf the the piano manufacturer uh, Steinway and Sons? Well, I got a job at Steinway and Sons because I love pianos. I loved pianos and I still do love pianos. Um, and. I was trained as a concert technician. Now, what a concert technician does is, is not only does he or she tune the piano, uh, he, a concert technician uh, checks the regulation of the piano, checks the tone of the piano. It's really an in-depth, sort of quite skilled job. And I loved it, actually. But part the job of being a concert technician was not going to people's houses to tune their pianos, but to be at concerts and recording sessions. Because obviously if you've got a recording session, if you've got the, I don't know, the, the London Symphony Orchestra and uh, Vladimir Ashkenazi playing the piano, these sessions are booked sometimes two years in advance to fit in with everybody's schedule. So the last thing they can have is a piano suddenly break a string or suddenly be out of tunes. So I've been doing this for about 45 years. Not, not this, but I've been recording. And, and doing that for about 45 years and, and during that time what what was absolutely fascinating for me then and now is that at Abbey Road I was exposed as, as a trainee I was exposed to so many different sorts of music and when I first thought about working in a recording studio um, really I suppose all I wanted to record was John Lennon that's, you know, that's really what I wanted to be called. I wanted to be there, I wanted to be in the same room as John Lennon. But, so, but as a trainee, you're told by the, the managers of the studio, you're doing this, hey, you're doing this for two weeks, or you're doing this on Sunday nights, or you're doing this for three months, or you're doing this for two days. You were put on sessions. So I was exposed to l so many different sorts of music, music that I didn't imagine existed. Um, and the, the first piece of music I heard in Studio One at Abbey Road as a trainee was Stravinsky's Firebird Suite, the last movement of Stravinsky's Firebird Suite. And I can't explain, it still makes me tremble. I can't explain to you the emotion that went through my whole body, the physical feeling of just excitement and thrill. It, it, it did bring me to tears. It was so moving and so wonderful, and, and and I wasn't then a great lover of classical music, but the way this music was being played and conducted and recorded, and to hear it live in that wonderful studio with an incredible orchestra, it was one of the most powerful experiences of my life. It, it was like being bathed in some incredible beauty I couldn't dream of existed. And uh, I still feel quite emotional about thinking about it. So there was that and then we I'd do middle of the road music, some rock music, some psychedelic type music, all different sorts. So you, you could be working at 10 o'clock in the morning with a sort of very middle of the road pub type pianist and then in the evening maybe doing something with David Gilmour uh, and then the next morning doing something with once again, Vladimir Ashkenazi playing the piano, or Daniel Barenboim, or listening to Rostropovich playing the, playing the cello. So the, 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 the width of the sort of music I was exposed to was huge, and it made me realise quite early on that it doesn't really 
matter about the genre of music. What matters is the talent and the articulation and the dedication and the passion of the musician playing that music. Because the music, great music, I still feel like this, great music transcends the genre and it even transcends the instrument it's played on. You know, when you, I did a, uh, I don't want to just talk about famous names, but for instance, I did, a, I did an album with uh, the American guitarist Pat Metheny. And when he played, you weren't hearing the guitar, you were just hearing music. And it's, and it's very difficult to explain what that feels like, but it was, it was something really sort of, really almost like an out of body experience. It was a, in a dream because you could hear the music without really understanding it was a guitar. It could have been a flute, it could have been a cello, it could have been an electric guitar, it could have been anything. So <clears throat> what Abbey Road, uh, goodbye Facebook, thank you. That was Facebook. We can go home now. <laughs>